Good morning and welcome to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting for September 10th, 2019. If you are able, you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Good announcements. Announcements. This is a time for county staff to provide updates of upcoming county events that may be of interest to the public. Here, any announcements from staff? Supervisor Mills. That's kind of interesting. I always remember September 11th and September 10th. If you remember, that was the Derby fire 18 years ago. But it was also the year that the towers went down. I happened to be in Rollins, Wyoming at that point, simply because we were short on water in Murphy's and Angel's Camp in Valleseal. So I hope that all of you will remember tomorrow. And we will have a flag uh, retirement ceremony here tomorrow morning at 845 for those that would like to attend. Thank you very much. In essence, some staff. Seeing none. Move forward. Uh, Mr. Uh, oh, Mr. Moss. Thank you. I apologize. Got to move quick. Just want to take this opportunity real quickly to uh, up the date, update the board on um, groundwater sustainability plan and the uh, groundwater sustainability agency. This is something we'll be bringing back before the board um, on October 8th and uh, thereafter as well. Um, I have a handout here. So um, as the board is aware, on uh, August 16th, 2019, the uh, Eastern uh, San Joaquin Groundwater Authority notified cities and counties and public utilities commissions, regulated companies who are located within the geographic area of the Eastern San Joaquin Subbasin of the notice of intent to adopt a groundwater sustainability plan or a GSP. Sorry, I ran in here. <laughs> And uh, public comment on the uh, uh, public draft GSP as distributed to the board occurred on July 10th of 2019 through August 25th of 2019. Um, that public draft GSP has been distributed to the board for review. Um, not for today's review, but for your opportunity to review that plan before we come back before the board for actual adoption of the GSP. So um, as you'll see and on the handout, you'll notice that uh, no sooner than 90 days from the date of the notice, um, each GSA must hold a public hearing and consider adopting the GSP. Now, again, that will be brought back before the board um, within, the next, uh, within the next two months. Um, so really that means that agencies need to adopt the GSP no sooner than November 16th of 2019, so we meet that 90-day deadline. Okay, and no later than December 1st of 2019, so that we can finalize the, G the JPA by the January 31st, 1st, uh, 2020 deadline. Um, and I know that I'm throwing a lot out here, but um, this is something we've had study sessions on and kind of discussed the GSP and the GSA as well. Uh, since existing MOU for the Eastside GSA is structured to leave uh, authority to individual boards, CCWD, Calaveras County, Rock Creek Water District, and Stanislaus County will all need to adopt the plan. Um, and then staff will be returning back on October 8th to talk about um, introducing a second amended draft to the MOU for the GS, uh, for the GSA. Now, originally that GSA was um, with all the parties involved, and Calaveras County Water District had the authority and was designated to make to represent the GSA. Um, the draft, the second draft amended um, plan that I'm currently working on and running by CCWD will designate the county for that purpose, and the, the board will have an opportunity to actually go ahead and take a look at that and approve it and make modifications as necessary. So um, on November 19th, we will bring back uh, the MOU after the board comments um, and CCWD comments and request the board to approve the GSP for the county. 
And I know this is a lot. Generally, like I say, I've done a couple updates before the board um, during the PowerPoint uh, presentations. Uh, so a lot to digest. But I want the board to be aware that we really are coming to the final, final pieces of the Groundwater Sustainability Agency and Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Again, absolutely has to be adopted because we're in that sub-basin that is in a state of overdraft pursuant to Bolton 118 of the Department of Water Resources. So with that said, this is simply an update. Please do contact me if you have any questions about the nuts and bolts of this, where we stand. But I want the board to be aware that this is coming down the pike. There's absolutely no surprises with this for the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no further uh, announcement, we'll move on to public comment. General public comment. Any, interest, any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board and is not posted on the consent or regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the Board of Supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30-minute allotted time period, the board may immediately move to the next order of business. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued as the last item of business <coughs> in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of comments to be heard. Thank you very much. Everybody will be allotted three minutes. We have a few new faces in the crowd today, so I will repeat the, the rules. So please be respectful. Uh, uh, turn off other electronic devices. Uh, <laughs> and have your comments reflect well upon our county. So, please, who's up first? Mr. Segala. Good morning, board. Uh, Al Segala, Taxpayer Association. Um, to, there's several things happened in September. One, of course, is 9-11, which is not a very pleasant thing to think about. But there's also, the on the 17th, is the anniversary of our Constitution. And so I put a few words together, um, and hopefully to be published, but it won't be published until after um, Constitution Week. And so here's what I put together. Will our kids be free? So September 17th is the 232nd anniversary of our wonderful U.S. Constitution. For many thousands of years, human slavery was normal, including in the United States. America was the first to claw its way out of the darkness of tyranny and put a solution down on paper. Our founding fathers possessed an incredible amount of knowledge and wisdom by recognizing human, natural human rights and restricting the size of the new government so those rights would be protected. This led the way for future generations to emerge from almost universal bigotry to enjoyment of liberty and prosperity today. Still not perfect, but going in the right direction. Just what are the fundamentals of human rights? Although Thomas Jefferson used the term pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence, the actual rights to uh, are life, liberty, and property as stated in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Will our children enjoy a free society? I think the answer is no. Unless we rediscover and share the principles of our free society, that includes learning about the Constitution and especially helping young people do the same. Perhaps the rise of socialism in America is in direct proportion to the ignorance of our Constitution and its purpose. I think there are two very easy ways to make a positive influence. The first is reading and sharing the fun little booklet, The U.S. Constitution and Fascinating Facts About It, which is free from the Taxpayer Association. The second is taking the free 10 lesson web course offered by Hillsdale College. Just Google Hillsdale College and you'll get right to it. When would be the 
best time to start? How about today? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. There, how many people intend to do public comment? If you can raise your hand. Great. We can speed things up if, we, if you want to line up no more than five deep in the back. It'll sort of speed things up. Good, Brian, morning. good morning. I'm Brian Smith from West Point. <laughs> This is relative to the proposed homeless shelters in West Point. First, I want to read a letter from my wife because she's unable to attend today. To whom it may concern, my name is Judy Phillips Smith. I am the fifth generation of my family to live in West Point. My parents bought their home on Bouvard Street in 1949. I now own that home. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in West Point. We are a small town where the business community is trying and succeeding to make a difference. West Point does not need a homeless shelter in the heart of our business district. We need to enhance our community uh, for future growth, and homeless shelters do not, I repeat, do not belong in downtown West Point. Okay. <clears throat> we had a meeting up there Thursday. Since then, I've gathered 153 signatures on a petition. This is a petition of grievances. We, the following citizens of West Point and Wilsonville, Calaveras County, do hereby petition the county, Calaveras County Board of Supervisors to henceforth halt any and all action for the establishment of a homeless shelter on Spink Road, West Point, California. We are following the example set forth by the founders of our great country when petitioning King George of England and is established under the First Amendment of the Those project is presented fiat a complex, done deal, without property. Both business and private did not receive proper notification. Three, the proposed location does not lend itself nor enhance our commercial district. Four, there is no guarantee of expanded law enforcement relative to this project. Five, there are realistically no jobs for the homeless to transition into. <clears throat> there is no six. There is no guarantee of transportation to employment for those homeless in transition. And seven, the rezoning, building down property improvements will be undertaken by the county at county expense without. Um, this proposed project is completely wrong. We have no services. We're at the far end of the county. It takes me 45 minutes to get here. We can't transition from living underneath a bush I, I have to uniformly report the three minute rule. So, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much. Casey? Uh, my name is Tim Casey. I also I live in, in Glencoe. I worked in the uh, West Point area for a while. I was teaching at the um, uh, elementary school. Um, I'm also the president. <laughs> Blue Mountain Coalition for Youth and Families, and um, and Brian and I stand on opposite ends of this project. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can um, find a way to get the sharp edges off this project to make it palatable for the people that are pushing back against it. I had a petition at the hardware store, and I ran into a gentleman who said, where's the petition? And he signed it, and I said, well, can I ask you what you know about the project? And he said, well, not much, but if it's good enough for Brian, it's good enough for me. And that's the kind of respect and I think authority that Brian has in the community. And so we saw each other out after yesterday's meeting in San Andreas, and we talked about it, and we think we we're going to sit down and maybe just agree to disagree. But um, on several points, uh, I think we have some room for movement, because there are services up in West Point. And the program would provide service for the people. And we're talking about two, well, three, but we're haggling, so it could be two of these tiny homes. 
not a five-story um, uh, homeless shelter. We're talking about two on our property for the uh, Blue Mountain property in front of the garden. We think it would be a good fit. We think it would be a really good fit. Um, there's going to be tons of oversight from the county. We're going to be there almost every day. Um, I think we could probably find some jobs for people in West Point. They're not going to be the great jobs, and, and Brian's right. They're not going to you know, support a family or a person, but it's going to be something that someone can do to get back on their feet. And so we are going to try and hash things out. And I, I guess my ultimate message to the board is we're working on it. We're working on it. We did roll it out. It was kind of like rolling out the Hindenburg on its last flight. It did not go well. Um, we weren't very well prepared on the Blue Mountain side. Um, Ms. Stranger was very well prepared. I just didn't see it coming. And so that's left a bad taste in a lot of West Point uh, communities' mouth. And so what Brian and I want to do is get together and at least get rid of that and then move on to try and see if we can't find some common ground because there are homeless. <laughs> a dozen people living out there, so half a dozen kids in the school that are couch surfing. So we'd like to be able to provide a place where um, people can, you know, have a home, have an address, get services, and maybe get back on their feet. So just um, let you know we are, we are working together to try and find a solution. Uh, we're going to try and work together to find a solution. So thank you very much for your time. Morning board. Um, I would just want to say I'm in full support of the tiny house project. I think that we need to start somewhere. And um, so many people that fall between the cracks and have difficulty accessing services um, just need a little bit of help. You know, I've been in situations a long time ago as a broke single mom that I went through a couple of weeks of homelessness. And at the time, there was a short-term short stay at a hotel that, um, you know, I just, it was a series of unfortunate events, and I just needed a little bit of help, and I got it. And I was able, in two weeks of a hotel voucher and a few food stamps, I was able to find a place to live, find a job, and not need any more help. It's as simple as needing an address to be, to fill out an application. And I'm aware that some of the people that are on the streets are veterans. We have 22 veterans committing suicide every day. We can't ignore the people that serve this nation. It's the anniversary of the Butte fire. So many people were displaced by that fire who continue to experience daily indignities at being underhoused. I just think as a community, we can pull together, find common ground, and show compassion to people less fortunate than us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kim Skeen, and I am a resident of Wilseyville. I'm here to express my objection to placing a homeless facility in West Point. I believe helping the homeless is the right thing to do, but it is very important that those efforts help them overcome their difficulties. That being said, these efforts need to be strategically planned to place them in a location that would best meet their need and give them the opportunity to be successful. Settling homeless people up in West Point on purpose would not be helping them. <laughs> Instead, it would be trapping them in their own homelessness. West Point is too far from medical facilities, county services, and most grocery stores. There are terrible storms and snow in the winter, along with many power outages. In addition, there are no jobs that would help them transition out of homelessness to get them back on their feet. On top of all the reasons I just mentioned, there are also no daily public transportation sources available that would facilitate them with any of these needs. The goal should be to help people be, um, become self-sufficient and thrive, and not to inadvertently make it more difficult for them to succeed. One alternative would be placing these homeless units in Valley Springs where they would be closer to everything. If we really want to help the homeless, let's really help them. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy?
Good morning, board staff. Catholic to Kathy Topol, Common Ground Senior Services. Um, as most of you are aware, we provide the Home Delivered Meals on Wheels program, and then we also have a transportation program, and we call it Silver Streak. And those that uh, take it, they like to refer to themselves as streakers. I'm here um, today because at a previous board meeting, Silver Streak was misrepresented. And I'd like to clarify, clarify some false information that was made against this valuable community service. Silver Streak provides the elderly, veterans, and individuals with disabilities an option for getting to health and wellness appointments. This includes in and out of county. So we're the only, play, only organization that takes people out of county to medical appointments. Um, and as you're aware, there's very few specialists in Calaveras County. Additionally, we make transports available for grocery shopping, pharmacy trips, and other errands that might not otherwise be available to those that require the use of an ADA vehicle. Last year, Silver Street provided 2,988 transports to 233 clients, and this includes 60 transports to dialysis appointments. These transports were completed using the fleet of 11 handicapped vehicles, eight staff, and four, uh, I'm sorry, five volunteer drivers. None of these clients were charged for any trip. In an effort to sustain this donation-based program, our staff continually searches for funding. The organization, organization has developed partnerships with county agencies, Caltrans, Area 12, Logisticare. Uh, we get donations from multiple community foundations. The county assists us with our Meals on Wheels program. Um, and as the mobility manager for Calaveras County, we work to inform residents of the best transportation option that fits their need. Um, this includes referrals to Calaveras, Amador, Tuolumne Transit Agencies, the Volunteer Center, cab companies, and other organizations that provide transports. Again, the mobility manager also continues to try to find funding. We encourage those seeking transportation services to contact us so they can be given accurate information in an effort to ensure that they have access to these health and wellness appointments at no charge. You've all heard of the secret shopper. Well, I'm inviting any of you to become a secret writer. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. For the public speakers. Seeing none, I will close public comment. We will move on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested party may request removal of an item from the consent agenda for later discussion. Full board members, anybody want to pull an item? Item 17. Item 17. Other items? Staff want to pull an item. Public. Seeing none, there is a motion to carry the remainder. So I'll move. Second. Moved by Supervisor Toffanelli, second by Supervisor Mills. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. Item 17 is from the administrative office to approve and authorize the board chair to sign the response to the fiscal year 2018-19 grand jury report. Supervisor Calloway, you had some questions. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Okay. <laughs> On um, the one regarding um, animal control services. On uh, jury finding one and the county response to finding one. The finding one states that <laughs> the facility's old, outdated, and insufficient to care for and house animals. Okay, finding one. The, board, the board's response partially disagrees with the finding. The facilities are aged, as many of the county holds, However, the animals are well cared for. According to the grand jury report, and those of you who have been around a long time, this is at least a minimum of a 20-year effort. 
As far as I'm concerned, the facility is old, outdated, and insufficient to care for and house animals. I think the Board of Supervisor needs to totally agree with this finding. It's about time that we step up. Um, it has nothing to do with how the animals are cared for or county uh, staff at animal services. This has to do with the facility. So I would like our response to be that the county agrees with this finding. Now, as we go on, they do ask for us to uh, provide the budget for a new building. What I propose is that within two years, we have a plan to do something about the building at Animal Services. Um, it is not sufficient for the animals, and it's definitely not sufficient for the staff that works there. So I would like to make those recommended changes to our response. Any responses? Any discussion on this item? Should I do one? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Rice Stopper? I concur with Marita on some of what she just brought up. I also want to bring up s some of the other things here, but I'm personally of the opinion this wasn't agendized properly, it being on the consent agenda, and thus want to make altercations to it. Can we do that and move forward? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, I have uh, some things here where uh, the grand jury findings on code compliance and and a majority of the things here we we agree with th these findings uh, the uh, po comprehensive policy procedure manual and everything um, it, they they say that the grand jury recommends the one being put together for co-compliance uh, it says here the supervisors agree with this finding on um, the recommendation for it to be done by December 31st of 2019. The recommendation has been implemented. The senior code enforcement officer drafted a manual that was approved by the interim chief billing official and county council in June of 2019. Um, and the manual is subsequently disseminated to staff and is in operation. I'd like to see that. <clears throat> and there, there, there's, there's quite a bit more here. And then I also, uh, the grand jury findings on college districts. Um, a lot of this is out of our hands, but it is something that we need to step up to and start petitioning the state on legislation to make these changes. I, I, I know very well that Mr. All is aware of what we would have to go through on this. It's a big concern um, on the west side of the county um, and recently Delta College has you know asked for a representative to make sure our money's being spent properly <laughs> come from our area and uh, I mean that who, who would that representative be and what are they what are they gonna say no it hasn't been they haven't followed through on what they promised Calvers County when we voted yes on that bond back in 2004 um, I, there, there, there's quite a few things here. I, I was going to bring up and pull this item. I'm glad Marita did. Um, I think we need to uh, listen to the grand jury. It's built built by our peers and constituents throughout the county, and a lot of times they look into things and they do have some recommendations that we should take heed to. Um. <clears throat> suppose we have a couple questions we could ask her uh, do we want to make changes right now here do we want to send it back to staff so we can work on it together and then bring it back in another agenda I think we have a statutory deadline to turn it in though don't we yes there is a deadline it is due at the end of this month but we can certainly make the edits that the board directs and then we can bring it back at the next board meeting for approval and still meet the statutory deadline okay um, Let's start, let's start at the top. 
Well, my Mr. Calloway? Um, I think it's about time that this board acknowledges that the facilities all outdated and insufficient to care for and house animals. We have to agree to that. I don't think we can continue to have the same grand jury report every year that says the same thing and we say the same thing. We need to do something about making that acknowledgement. I would like that um, in the response to um, the grand jury recommendation on doing something that instead of saying spatializations, complicated, yada da, that we say that with within two years that we have we will have a plan. I'm not saying that we're funding it yet, but part of that plan could be funding mechanisms for a new shelter. Um, so I would like those changes in our recommend in our recommend and our response to the grand jury. Okay. <coughs> so let me pull the board. First item is, and make sure I got this right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, make sure I've got this right. Is to make a affirmative acknowledge affirmative um, statement that we agree with the grand jury's report as far as the facilities are outdated. Yes. That is item. That is the first poll before us. Supervisor Mills, your lights on. Yeah, I think uh, first we need to understand a little bit of history here, too. You remember that when you and I came on the board, the Humane Society was working with the county to sure. try to establish a facility. And uh, when that fell through, and that was in our first year, uh, we just kind of let go of it. And they went their way, we went ours. Uh, that meant that we kind of dropped the ball because there was a need at that time. It was identified. But uh, then we subsequently, in our space planning here recently, last year, uh, we really didn't identify anything that we were going to do about it. So we kind of dropped the ball again when we had that opportunity in our space planning review to uh, at least start that discussion. I think the board needs to direct staff to at least begin the discussion, put together some plans, try to find out what funding sources are available and where it could be located. Where it's located now is not an ideal spot. Uh, there, there has to be better options, but I think that staff needs to work through what those options are and uh, that we can move forward with at least developing some type of a plan. Again, I agree with Supervisor Calloway. It's not going to be an immediate thing that we can do, but if we at least get the cart on the road, uh, we'll, we'll be moving in a direction towards getting something done. Okay. <clears throat> Supervisor Topper? Acknowledge. Supervisor Toffinelli? Well, there's a lot more history to it than what Dennis has brought up. And Marina knows this, this dates back a long time ago. Even the 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 um, situation with the Humane Society that dates back many years to trying to get it together. Um, there's been many um, suggestions and ideas and plans to move where it's at. Um, at one time, it was across from the airport, um, some land there. Um, but it has been kicked down the road for a while, so I'll, I'll agree. Uh, okay. How about the, within two years, um, candidates come up with plans. Does that seem reasonable for everybody as well? Well, I picked two years. Supervisor Calloway? I picked two years because I looked at the <coughs> goals in our budget book that the CAO <coughs> Um, is proposing for his department. I want to be respectful of that, but I don't want it to drag to drag on. So I felt two years. It can be his goal for 2021. So that's how I picked two years to at least develop a plan and to start to put together. Develop a plan. Correct. I would agree to that. Yes. Stopper. Okay. So we'll direct staff to um, Sue, Councilor. I just wanted to um, inform the board. I was trying to pull the um, penal code section up. Um, here we go. It does, uh, does the penal 
code does require that when the board is looking at um, a recommendation requiring further analysis, that we include <clears throat> um, we include a time frame for the matter to be prepared in, in, for discussion. Um, that that time frame. Um, cannot exceed six months. Obviously, completion of a recommendation is going to take much more than six months, but staff would, um, according to the penal code, be required to report back to the board as far as what, how we are proceeding with the recommendation and laying out certain time periods and, and um, a path forward within six months. So uh, I just wanted the board to be aware, although you're saying two years, I wanted you and the public to know that we will be reporting back within six months. Good. Pursuant to the penal code. Okay. Any other items on the animal shelter before we no. move on to code compliance? Okay. So we got direction. On that. Sir, as a stopper, you had some direction regarding uh, code compliance. Which not, not so much because uh, a major majority, majority of the findings are. Uh, are in agreement here. Um, I think uh, I would like to see that book personally. I, I don't really see too many revisions that that I would put in place on the response. Do you want to see the book before we vote? I, just, I would too. I, I would like to be interested. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you why that's important. It's because it's a matter of policy. Yes, it is. And uh, if we're the policy body, then we're the ones that are going to have to review it and not just accept what has been put down uh, right. without seeing it. Okay. So. Does anybody else want to see the book, or shall we just make sure everybody gets a copy? Can we make sure everybody gets a copy? Very good. Sue Roger Stopper, anything else on code compliance? No. How, how about community college district? Uh, any changes we want to make in there? Certainly. Uh, and major issue. But. I agree with the county response for the most part on that, but this, this, uh, maybe we could take in some public comment. Okay. And then we could finish up here. You got it. There might be something enlightening. Let's do some public comment. Come on down. Again, it's be three minutes apiece. Uh, I think everybody here knows the drill. Uh, good morning. Ralph Copeland, District 4, Copperopolis. Uh, current member of the Calaveras County Grand Jury. Uh, past member last year of the Calaveras uh, Grand Jury. I'm here before uh, the implementation of your responses. Uh, basically, as a reminder, this is what you've read. All of you have read front to back. We had to sign for it. I appreciate it. Um, also, um, uh, Ms. Steadfeld, uh, the council uh, brought up my points exactly of, uh, of the penal code uh, 93305. All this is public knowledge. Uh, under compliance, the responses received must meet legal requirements as defined in penal code 933 and penal code 93305 with respect to the timeliness of the response and whether the response met the mandated format and content. Next is responsiveness. The responses must be clear and not evasive. The entities understood the issues in report and responded accordingly. Implementation. Implementation dates must be clearly identified in the response to the findings and recommendations. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your service on the uh, jury as well. Ms. Um, I'm glad this was pulled off the consent agenda. I think it's really crucial that code compliance um, fulfill the role that they do in health and safety. Um, it would be delightful if it could be a collaborative process between the people that are trying to come into compliance and the county. Um, I think that many of us have health and safety in mind and would like nothing more than to be compliant. Thank you. Thank you.
Further public comment? See none, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, there are other changes that anybody would like to see the staff bring back when they bring it back on uh, the comments or so uh, this was an action item so we will move this to a date certain is that correct probably the 17th I, I would recommend in case there are any modifications we bring it back on the 17th although the 17th is set aside for a study session that still gives one up one more opportunity before the 24th for action and give another opportunity for the board okay then um, yes Supervisor Mills? Yes. Supervisor yes. Kelly? Very well. Move that item forward to date certain on the 17th. All right. Go on to the regular agenda. Item number 18 is from... Two minutes to set up. Excuse me. We're going to take a two-minute break and let uh, planning uh, set up. So don't go anywhere far. Welcome back to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting. We are on item 18. It's from the planning department to adopt a resolution finding that the Murphy State Route 4 Complete Streets Plan is exempt from CEQA and adopting said plan. Mr. Maurer. Good morning, Peter Maurer, planning director. With me today is Tanya Sundberg from PlaceWorks. Um, and I'm just going to turn it over to her right now to do a quick introduction of the plan and then when she's done I'll talk about some of the issues that uh, were raised at the Planning Commission and by the public um, we'll go from there so take it away Tanya. Great thank you Peter. Um, good morning Chair Garamendi and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm really pleased to be here today to present to you the complete streets plan for on the Highway 4 corridor and Murphy's. Um, as Peter said, my name is Tanya Sundberg. I'm with PlaceWorks. We're the lead consultant on this project. I'm also a resident of Murphy's, so it's really exciting for me to be here and um, uh, at this stage of the project with you today. Uh, this project was a cooperative effort between the county, the Council of Governments, and Caltrans. It, in fact, it was funded through the Caltrans uh, Sustainable Communities Grant Program. <laughs> that grant was awarded to the Council of Governments, uh, also with some lo local matching funds funds from the Council of Governments. Uh, and with us today in the audience, we have um, Amber Collins from the COG, as well as Kevin Schroeder uh, from Caltrans, and they're also available to answer questions if they come up. Uh, so the project um, was really focused on developing this complete streets plan um, to identify and prioritize uh, improvements along the Highway 4 corridor through Murphy's. Um, and those improvements are focused on per making it a safer place for all modes of travel, including bicyclists and pedestrians. And this plan itself will really be helpful for both the county and the Council of Governments to obtain future grant funding uh, to implement the projects that are identified in the plan. The project was community driven uh, and involved an advisory committee and also we have a website. I'll go over those a little bit later um, when I talk about outreach overall. So the project was focused on the Highway 4 corridor in Murphy's as I said and it started at its east end was down around Feeney Park. Um, it went, uh, I'm sorry, it's west end is at Feeney Park and it went east along Highway 4 up to about um, uh, um, Tanner and um, a right, kind of right before the road kind of starts getting up into them uh, going uphill um, and then it also included the uh, some little spurs along Penn Gulch and also along Big Trees and um, Main Street and Jones Street going out to that four-way stop right at the edge of Main Street Murphy's <clears throat> the project goals are summarized on this slide we wanted to create safe pedestrian bicycle connections um, to Michelson Elementary School as well as um, along the whole Highway 4 corridor in that area, um, improve safety for all modes, um, create a better sense of cohesiveness and connectivity to Main Street Murphy's from Highway 4, uh, engage community members uh, to identify and prioritize the improvements, establish clear gateways um, at each entrance to the town, beautify the corridor and slow traffic through Murphy's so that uh, drivers are alert to the fact that there is pedestrian and bicycle activity. 
We, project, we started the project in December of 2017 with our existing conditions analysis. Uh, we've been working since then on all these phases that are shown on the slide. Um, we introduced the project to the community. We developed alternative ways to address the um, issues that were identified. We got community input on those alternatives, procured a preferred alternative, um, and then got community feedback again and um, brought it out for a public review. So I'll go over those in a little more detail as we get through the presentation. Early in the project, we identified um, some key issues and opportunities, um, both from our existing conditions analysis as well as through coordination with Caltrans. Um, first and foremost, uh, the Caltrans has a project through its State Highway and Operation Protection Program, which is also called SHOP for short, um, and that's a, a project to install a two-way left turn lane on Highway 4 between Penn Gulch and Main Street. Um, so that project is fully funded and is currently in its design and environmental phase and will be installed within the next several years. And so this, is, this um, plan is really kind of building from the big opportunity that that presents to um, do a lot more along that whole corridor um, for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so through our uh, demographic analysis early on, um, it demonstrated that there is a need for complete streets improvements in this corridor. There's a high percentage of households with lower incomes and also older residents. Those um, indicate that there are people who maybe don't have access to a car or who can't drive. Um, and also there's a high percentage of people who already walk to work. So there is a need for and a desire for uh, safe places to walk and bike in the community based on that analysis. Um, also, with a, we looked at the walkability and bikeability, looking at how close um, origins and destinations are to each other. And that lots of origins and destinations are close to each other, close enough to walk or bike, but people don't actually do that because of the lack of safe connections. Um, uncoordinated signage was a key issue, along with parking. Um, uh, we conducted an a analysis of historic collision data and found that there's a little cluster of um, collision um, uh, history at the Penn Gulch and Highway 4 intersection and also at the um, Feeney Park where Feeney Park um, abuts uh, Highway 4. Um, so there's a need for some improved um, traffic safety in that area. And then our engineering analysis generally found the, that there was a lack of pedestrian amenities. Um, there are wide roadways and intersections which make it um, less safe for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, there are unclear pedestrian paths of travel. There's a lack of bicycle facilities throughout the study area and there are unsafe crosswalk and roadway configurations. But there are a lot of opportunities to um, make those uh, environments more safe and comfortable for bicyclists and pedestrians just by adding amenities. And so that's a lot of what, that's really the focus of this um, plan. So as I mentioned at the outset, this project was community driven. Um, so I wanna take a moment to um, summarize the, the various ways we conducted outreach. Uh, there was an advisory committee that met five times throughout the course of the project. They provided really important guidance to um, keep us on the right path. Um, that advisory committee was made up of 12 members, um, including representatives from local businesses and the Murphy's Business Association, the tourism industry, the community club, uh, the school, the sanitary district, parents and residents and other advocates. Uh, the community um, met in three formal workshops. We had great participation at our workshops. Our first workshop, we, we conducted a walking tour where we um, organized groups walking through the corridor and they um, pointed out the issues that they wanted to see addressed and talked about ways that they think the um, county and the COG could um, uh, fix those. Uh, then we also met to present alternative improvement options to address those issues and tell us what they wanted to, um, which of those alternative improvement options they would prefer. Um, then we put that into a preferred plan and brought that back to the community to review. Um, and at that last workshop, we also asked the community members to prioritize among those improvements. So tell us what is the most important uh, set of improvements uh, so that we can prioritize those when uh, we go out for funding after the plan is approved. Uh, outside of those formal workshops, we had these informal pop-up events where we set up a booth or a table at community events where people already were, so we could try to access some of those folks that didn't have time to come out to a workshop. So we went to the chicken in a barrel event that the um, Parents Club puts on, one of the first Fridays in the park in Murphy's, and we also went out to the Grape Sump. And we had other uh, meetings with local groups like the Business Association. We conducted a parent survey in coordination with the school, and we had a website. So there's a lot of really um, helpful outreach that really drove the process. 
So now I'm going to uh, go over the, what is in the plan in terms of the improvements, starting with really kind of big, oh, big picture overview. Um, that central section of Highway 4, um, which is from Penn Gulch to Tom Bell Road and Big Trees, that's kind of what we call the central section. And in that section, the plan calls for five to six foot wide sidewalks on both sides of the street with a uh, landscape buffer, uh, also uh, 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 buffered bike lane on both sides of the road, um, improved and new pedestrian crossings, street lighting at intersections, and taking that center turn lane that's planned from the shop project that goes from Penn Gulch to Maine, but actually extending that all the way to Big Trees and Tom Bell Road. Um, outside of the central section of Highway 4, um, the plan generally calls for what's called a side path, um, which is also separated from the roadway, but is only on one side of the road and has both directions of travel, so it's wider. Um, and some other treatments that I'll go over. Um, here you can see some cross sections of what that would look like. The top photo um, or top diagram shows what is planned for the shop project, that two-way center turn lane with some wide <coughs> shoulders. In um, uh, the draft plan on the lower left section, uh, lower left graphic, um, you can see that it has the same center turn lane as the shop project, but then it has the bike lanes and um, the separated sidewalk. Outside of that central area, that, that um, wider side path on one side of the road is shown. So that's what it looks like in a cross section. <clears throat> so we've kind of split up this corridor into um, some segments, and so I'm going to go through each segment, um, highlighting what the big um, projects are. So, so we're going to start at the west end. So this is near Feeney Park. Um, and what the plan calls for in this end is uh, a separated side, side path, that, that separated wider side path that I showed you, um, that would go from Feeney Park up to uh, Penn Gulch. Um, and then other than that, there's, um, the plan calls for enhanced shoulders, which are wider shoulders with the rumble strip, so alert drivers if they're heading off the road, the travel way. Um, and then there's also this informal parking area that's currently used at Feeney Park. Um, this is something that a lot of, I think, parents use during um, ball games and practices. It is not a formal parking area, but the plan calls to formalize that with uh, a, a single ingress, egress with striped parking and pavement. Moving um, east at Penn Gulch. Um, the plan calls for two phases um, at this Penn Gulch and Highway 4 intersection. The first phase would install what's called a, um, a pedestrian hybrid beacon. So this is really similar to what you find at the Bret Hart High School where to get from the parking lot to the high school where if a pedestrian wants to cross Highway 4, they would push a button and then the light would change, would go yellow and then to red and vehicles would stop, the pedestrian would cross. But when no pedestrians are using it, there would be no um, light turned on. So um, there's uh, kind of a no impact to the travel unless a pedestrian needs to cross. Um, in a second phase, we would um, install a full traffic signal if uh, warrants were met. Um, and then, and you can see the, this visual simulation on the left that's looking from Penn Gulch uh, to Highway 4 and what that would look like in the, um, the first phase. And then along, uh, along Penn Gulch, the plan calls for a side path on the south side that, gets from this, um, that goes from Highway 4 to the um, Feeney Park parking lot. Um, there's an existing crosswalk on, across Penn Gulch. Um, and that would be improved, and also um, planting some street, street trees to address some glare issues. Um, and then east of Feeney Park, Penn Gulch would uh, have um, Class 3 bike route signage added to make it a safer um, travel way for bicyclists. Um, moving uh, east, this is the, the central um, part of Highway 4 in our study area. Um, so this is, um, uh, this, the, the plan calls for adding these uh, lands, uh, sidewalks with the landscape buffer that I described earlier and the bike lanes on both sides of Highway 4. It also calls for a new crosswalk across Highway 4 at Main Street. Um, and this would have a high visibility crosswalk with a rapid yellow flashing light, um, but not a stop, stop light. Um, and then also to cross Main Street, we would add crosswalks. There are currently none um, to cross Main Street and also a gateway sign um, here to direct traffic um, to know that historic Main Street Murphy's is down this roadway. Um, the visual simulation on the left shows um, what it looks like on Highway 4 looking east at the Main Street intersection. <clears throat> Further east on, at Big Trees Road and Tom Bell Road, 
Um, this project would extend, uh, sorry, the, the plan calls for the extension of those sidewalks and bike lanes further all the way to um, this intersection. Uh, also the extension of that two-way left turn lane to this intersection. Um, at the uh, uh, Tom Bell and Big Trees Road intersection, uh, the, there would be painted curb extensions to make the, the turning uh, tighter and slow vehicles when they're turning, but it maintains um, access for trucks at the same time. We would have crosswalks on all four sides of all four legs of that intersection. Um, and then there would also be gate, uh, gateway signage installed um, at this intersection as well to direct vehicles um, traveling west to know that they can turn onto Big Trees Road to access Main Street Murphy's, uh, along with a beautification project through landscaping. And then also, if, as you turn down big trees, the Creek View intersection is, it was an area of concern. That's a, that's a way that a lot of residents who live in this residential area can access Sierra Hill Shopping Center and also Main Street. And um, so there's, uh, the plan calls for uh, a crosswalk across Creek View and then a new um, mid-block crossing um, across Big Trees Road at the Sierra Hill Shopping Center so that um, there's a clear and safe pedestrian path for those residents. Um, for going further east from uh, Tom Bell Road, this is the outer edge of this um, plan area. It calls for uh, enhanced shoulders again, um, as well as a side path on the north side of Highway 4, which would go behind the CHP way station um, within a utility easement for the adjacent development, um, as well as a new crosswalk across uh, Brett Hart Drive. And then last, the last section um, is this um, area of um, kind of including Main Street, Big Trees Road, and Jones Street kind of um, coming out of the Highway 4 corridor. Um, so at that four-way stop um, the clip, uh, at Main Street and Scott Street and Big Trees, the plan calls for um, crosswalks on all four legs of the intersection. Um, also calls for sidewalks, a continuous sidewalk on the north side of Main Street. Uh, um, a gravel pathway on Jones Street to kind of create, keep more of the rural character, um, and then improving and connecting the sidewalk that's there on Big Trees Road, so it uh, covers the whole extent of that road. And then we also looked um, further out on um, from this area, and, and the plan calls for adding Class Three bike, bike route signage on Six Mile Road to, to um, provide a safer opportunity for people who are biking out to Ironstone Vineyards. <coughs> So the last um, main part of the plan really focuses on implementation and financing. Um, at our last community workshop, we asked the community members to prioritize among the various projects. Um, and so based on that input, we grouped the projects into eight implementation packages. So those packages were um, identified based on the community priorities, as well as considering how projects will actually be implemented and whether it makes sense to do certain projects at the same time. Um, and so we started to group them that way and then we refined the, the content of each package so that the total cost of that package will um, be kind of fit the funding opportunities that will be available in the future. So package A is the top priority for the project. That includes the pedestrian hybrid beacon at um, the Penn Gulch intersection, the side path along Penn Gulch, and the crosswalk improvements in that area. Um, so this is really focused on safety around Michelson Elementary School, which is really one of the fundamental goals of the plan. This, is very, this package is very competitive for grant funding. Uh, package B looks at that area um, from, uh, on Highway 4 from Penn Gulch to uh, Main Street, so it would include the sidewalks and bike lanes, the full traffic signal if warranted, um, and the intersection improvements at Highway 4 and Main Street. Um, this is also very competitive for grant funding. Package C would go um, continue down um, east on Main Street to bring those sidewalks and bike lanes to the Big Trees intersection, um, and it also includes those um, Big Trees intersection improvements. This will, once Package B is done, this project will be um, very competitive as well for grant funding to complete um, a, a sidewalk and um, uh, you know, co connectivity for pedestrians and bicyclists. Package D uh, is, <coughs> 
um, uh, includes the big trees and Main Street um, sidewalk and crosswalk improvements. So this is really about those downtown connections and, and, and bringing people from Highway 4 to downtown. Also the safety for those residents who um, use the Creek View um, access. And there are possible grant funds for this package as well as the possibility that local development could fund portions of it as well as county maintenance funds. Package E uh, is focused on drawing people into historic downtown uh, Murphy's, and so it includes the gateway signage and the beautification at the Big Trees intersection. Um, and this project is something that is most likely um, to be funded from local business um, or consolidated into a larger grant pro um, project. Package F includes the side path along Highway 4 at the, at the east end of the um, project area, that area behind the CHP way station, and also the enhanced shoulders. Um, package G includes the formalized, is at the west end, and includes the formalized parking at Feeney Park uh, and the enhanced shoulders in that area. And then package H is focused on those really outer areas, the, the bike route signage on Penn Gulch and Six Mile Road, and a stop sign at the Feeney Park entrance. So this plan, the draft plan, has been out for public review this summer, and we have heard from uh, members in the community. Um, there have some, been some corrections that have been noted for the historical context that we um, plan to add into the final plan. Um, we also uh, recommend adding existing sidewalks to one of the figures to help demonstrate where the sidewalk gaps are. Um, and then also there's a correction that we have to one of the, to the crosswalk diagram um, for the Main Street and Big Trees and Scott Street intersection. Um, there have been uh, some comments um, submitted that I think are part of your packet related to the parking area at Feeney Park, and so there are some concerns from members of the community about that and, and a request that we actually remove that um, improvement from the plan. Um, so those, that's a summary of the public comments. And as, um, so your recommended action is to uh, adopt the resolution to find the plan exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and adopt the plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maher. Yes, just want to uh, highlight a couple of, of issues that have been raised. And uh, first is full disclosure, uh, my wife is the president of the Feeney Park Board. Uh, and there, you have some communication from the from members of the board regarding the concerns about uh, the parking along um, the highway. Uh, this plan doesn't commit the county to any specific action. There's no funding commitment at this point in time. This is a, a sort of a menu of options identifying uh, what the community felt uh, were, was the, uh, the highest priorities uh, for potential funding and actions in the future. Um, any decision to make any of these improvements would either be done through uh, you know, on the state highway by Caltrans, or if there's any commitment of county funds would be you know, brought before the board as a capital improvement project before any commitment to funding is done. Um, the, the concern about the, the parking um, is, you know, something that would have to be looked at more closely with uh, when Caltrans does any work within the right-of-way um, to look at, at safety concerns uh, and would take into consideration the park's um, concerns about emergency access and um, the safety at that location. Um, you also received another letter, I think, the other day uh, from uh, someone who was concerned about uh, the two-way left turn lane um, that can sometimes be misconstrued as a passing lane. Apparently this happens uh, in Hathaway Pines at times. Um, that is a decision that Caltrans has already made uh, to put that in uh, to this, you know, in the, in the stretch of highway. It was a decision made several years ago by Caltrans, um, and while it's uh, incorporated in, into this plan, um, it's because it is already a decision made by Caltrans to put in that two-way left turn lane. And as Tanya pointed out, we're building <coughs> off that opportunity to look at how can we make sure that when Caltrans makes those improvements, it includes the potential for future improvements and doesn't preclude that from happening because of whatever design Caltrans does at that point in time. So uh, with that, i um, open to any questions you might have. Again, um, Kevin uh, Schroeder from Caltrans and uh, Amber Collins from the COG are here if you have any questions of them. Thank you. Supervisor Stopper? <clears throat> you addressed some of the financing questions I had. So this is the first step for us out applying for some grants, and then as Caltrans does some of the other work, this could be incorporated into some of that other work as they proceed up Highway 4. Yes. <clears throat> so at this point, we're making no obligations to county spending any funds towards, the, towards this. 
um, project that, that will be brought before us as we proceed in the future as the project expands through each step. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Mills? Yeah, I know that uh, as I attend their meetings regularly, Murphy Sanitary had completed their project of the main feeder line down through on the south side of Highway 4 just recently. And uh, I know that they coordinated with Caltrans to get that done. There was a lot of coordination that had to be done for that. Um, we had worked with the sanitation district on this to make sure that, and there were some readjustments that were done for that to ensure that uh, future sidewalks could, and uh, some of the improvements could be made and not um, ruin the improvements they just put in. Uh, right. I, I only want to speak to the, the great coordination that happened between the sanitary district, Caltrans, and our local agencies when that all came together to understand what is the future and and where do they fit, how do they move their easements within that. So um, it was just a, a great job on everybody's part to put that all together. Um, the concern that I have with Six Mile would be the width of the road currently between Jones Street and, uh, and Couts. It's, just, it's already a narrow road. If we throw a bike trail in there, a bike path in there in the future, there will be some width it's not an actual bike path, right. it's more just signage to, right. you know, so that vehicles will recognize this is a popular cycling route. There's already people that ride there on a regular basis and just more of an advisory that you know, share, share the road kind of signage. Okay. That, you know, there are bikes on the road, be careful of them. So as, as we move forward with each one of these projects, is there's going to be road width issues and easement issues that are going to have to be addressed as those projects come into discussion. Each of those projects will have separate engineering to look at the details. We'll have environmental review associated with, with those projects. So we'll look at all the details at the time those future projects come in. And the issue of Tom Bell is something, uh, Tom Bell and Four, is something that I had to deal with back in 1992. So it isn't like this is a new issue. And just to get the stoplight put up there uh, for those folks uh, that are in the park crossing the street to get to the post office was an issue back then. So. I'm, I'm certainly pleased to see that we're moving forward towards improving it even more and providing a better a better access point. And Penn Gulch has likewise been a, just a real tough situation for us. Uh, so uh, those are the two key segments that have been long overdue and needing to be addressed. And uh, this project, the series of projects here speaks directly to those and getting those done. That, uh, that center area, which call, we call it the nomad's land, <laughs> area in a, in a drive zone uh, between uh, Penn Gulch and then going up to Jones Street. That's always been a problem, just simply because of the speeds in there, the amount of traffic. There's a lot of traffic that runs through on that section of road. So uh, anything that we can do to, to make it safer, especially for those people that turn left, uh, the better that we're going to make it for everybody. So thank you for your work. Thank you for the effort that was put out and for the community to be involved in it. Where is Galloway, your district? Yes, I vote yes, and so let's move on. But um, <coughs> I have to say that the process that PlaceWorks did was absolutely the best, the best planning community involvement project I have ever seen since I've been involved with Calaveras County. So. I give lots of credit to PlaceWorks for getting us to where we are. I was, and everyone I went on my walking tour with were really surprised. So thank you to you and your company. Um, <clears throat> and I support the, the pri number one priority. Years ago, we had a grant for Safe Routes to School for Michelson. We could not get the school to agree to the different designs for whatever reason that don't need to be discussed today. And I believe Jenny Lynn uh, wound up getting that grant. So, I mean, it stayed within the county. So everyone acknowledges number, the first one as being a high priority. Um, the plan, the plan and the things that people came up with in this process really fit into the Murphy's Douglas Flat community plan and something that was written, I don't know, 35 years ago 
yes, it needs to be updated. But they did talk about walking paths and so forth then. So I think this really still meets with the vision of the community. And I look at this more as a vision than because when you said, well, we have a shop project on Highway 4, but it's going to be several years before it's done, and that's already been approved and funded. So, you know, we're probably talking 30 and 40 years down the road. Um, but the fact that we have a plan and a vision, I, I think, is a good start. Um, the Feeney, the parking on 4, seems to me that's something that could be worked out as a sidebar to uh, this plan because I think it's going to keep coming up in, within the next few years. Um, I do have a question from Mr. Schroeder on the lights, the one that's proposed and the one that's there now on Tom Bell. This is sort of a sidebar, but I'm taking advantage of your being here. Can that light be controlled remotely? When we, ha uh, when we had um, the evacuation during the Butte fire, traffic was backed up from the light to Hathaway Pines or Avery, or, you know, 10 miles up the road. And so that was, that's a real concern on the safety of people being able to come off the mountain. And this past Monday, um, and it was the first time I had seen it, there was traffic backed up from that light up to Forest Meadows at, Gate. To Forest Meadows Gate, at least. I didn't want to say that. I was trying to pick Northwood. Um, thank you, <laughs> Supervisor. And that was another time it would have been nice to have that the light. And I was told that the key to change the light, the person was CHP, was in Sacramento for training. I didn't know, is there a way that can be done remotely from your Caltrans dispatch? So I'm not sure. I'm just going to be honest with you. But it's something I can take back and ask because... Okay. Yes, usually we want CHP to be there to actually regulate the lights in case something goes wrong and they then can step in and actually do right. their situation. Um, I do know that we've gone out multiple times and actually try to tune the lights better for the weekends and on the weekdays. Um, but I can hear it's not working so well, so I'll take that back to my engineers. We do That's have an electrical unit that hopefully can work on that. And then if we can do something like that, I'll bring up to my direct supervisor to see if there is something remotely. Okay. Thank you. Just no thought I'd throw that in. And I want to note when you say you go to Tanner, it's not the winery, but the street. Yeah. Because I kept saying, Tanner, Tanner. <laughs> to me, that's a winery. Um, it's anyway. a winery. Oh, and it's a logging company, too. You're right. The other side of the county. <laughs> the other side of the county. Anyway, I am really impressed with the plan that was put together and the community involvement. Um, it was just superb, and I do think it represents the vision, the issues, the desires of the people in the community. And I'd like to... Uh, move on this item and oh, sorry I do some public comment oh yeah I, ask? I, ask I, ask Wilson. I got a question this only came up as a result of a <coughs> hurricane over in South Carolina and Georgia is is that they do what's called lane reversals has Caltrans ever considered lane reversals in California uh, to, to actually they take the freeway and everybody goes one direction away from away from the ocean so to speak It's just a it's just a thought. Yeah, I'm I'm not 100% sure, but I believe when or, uh, Oroville, when the dam was having an issue, I think we did that. In you certain did sections. lane reversals up there, but there's no. Is there any policy that the state has regarding that? You know, I do not know. I'm not sure if that's because obviously it has to be CHP that's going to allow us to shut down the highway and control access and things like that. So, and I'm sure you're thinking about fires and yeah. that situation. Um, I'm sure we can work together and make some kind of. Um, 
management plan that if something was to happen in that section, how we would progress with Caltrans and CHP, especially because they do have a, a station right there. Um, so I'm willing to exchange emails and we can have a discussion about that um, outside of this plan. Please, please do. Yeah, it's outside the plan, but it's just one of those things that I know that in many other parts of our county, okay. having that ability to, to evacuate large quantities of cars quickly. Yeah, I have no problem bringing back the request okay. and seeing where we can take it. We can talk from COG. All right, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for the work, too. That's pretty high praise from uh, Supervisor Callaway. We've seen a lot of plans in her service to the county. Um, um, Supervisor Mills asked the question I had, which was about the right-of-way. There's obviously major expansions of streets, and that's always a concern in our county. And uh, it'd be interesting what you come with Feeney Park. I'm sure, like a lot of folks up here, I've been on a lot of spent a lot of Saturday afternoons watching little kids chase soccer balls around that field. So, it'd be good to figure out. We will move forward to public comment. If you'd like to comment on item 18, please come forward. I guess I get to play devil's advocate. It's quite a plan. Um, the government is using a behavioristic carrot on the stick of potential grants if you're willing to comply with their idea of utopia. A lady attending the planning meeting who was involved in planning Honolulu brought out that the paradise tragedy during the fire caused people to fry in their cars because of the gridlock caused by having a narrow road such as this. At least one of the commissioners was very concerned about whether those who travel or commute on Highway 4 had been asked about what they thought about this. And it didn't seem like um, there had been a lot of effort to ask the people who commuted or visited on Highway 4. And uh, the parking, when it's made formal, takes away the amount of cars that can park. It's difficult for people to find a parking place sometimes after there's lines that you have to go into. And um, so anyway, I apologize, but you guys, it was quite a job you've been working on. Thank you. Next speaker. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Again, I, uh, I appreciate this. Murphy's is a very important <coughs> economic driver in our county. Second. Oh, my supervisor, Callaway? Yeah, that's my name. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> my supervisor, Callaway, second. My supervisor, Stopper. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? That's fine, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> We move on to, yeah, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll return here at uh, 1036 or so. Welcome back to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting. We are on number 19. Item 19 is from the Planning Department to adopt a resolution disestablishing Agricultural Preserve Contract Number 309 and simultaneously establishing Agricultural Preserve Number 364 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Roland and Francisca Chabram on behalf of the Chabram Family Trust. Mr. Maurer. So I um, just wanted to note that the next six items are actually three items. Uh, there is a uh, we have that contract and zoning amendment, so it might be advisable to combine those, you know, each of those pairs into a, a one, one hearing. So item 19 and 20 go together, 21 and 22, and 
23 and 24. Would you like me to read the recommendation for the following item so that it's on the record? That would be great. Okay. So item 20 is also from the planning department to conduct a public hearing and adopt an ordinance approving the zoning amendment to agricultural preserve to recognize agricultural preserve contract number 364 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Roland and Francisca Shabram, trustees of the Shabram Family Trust, and authorize the summary publication. Okay, so we will, we're dealing with 19 and 20 together, correct? We have open day public hearing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So this is the uh, first of 13 um, ag preserves that we'll be bringing forward to you this year. Um, so the first one we'll be looking at is um, a California Land Conservation Contract and Zoning Amendment for Roland and Franziska um, Shabram. The proposal is to establish an agriculture preserve for a total of 281.11 acres of land located at 3206 Gillum Road, um, southeast of Paloma Road near Valley Springs. In 2009, um, Ag Preserve contract number 309 was established for a total of 199.07 acres. In 2018, the Shabroms purchased two additional parcels of land contiguous to their existing preserve. Um, now their request is to add the uh, two parcels totaling 82.04 acres to their existing preserve. The current agriculture operation consists of 50 head of beef cattle. Previous years, they've reported a gross annual income of, from production of $8,000, uh, therefore uh, meeting the minimum $2,000 requirement. Um, the land has been in agriculture production since at least 1971, likely before then, when John Fisher originally established his agriculture preserve contract number 44. Uh, two of the parcels are currently zoned Ag Preserve because they are um, currently under contract. The two additional parcels are zoned Rural Residential and Residential Agriculture. Pursuant to county resolution, we also need to rezone um, the parcels to Ag Preserve signifying the land is um, currently restricted um, by the uh, Agriculture Preserve pursuant to the Williamson Act. The lands are noted in the general plan as being designated natural resource lands, agriculture preserve with a high capability to sustain agricultural operations. Um, the general plan update has designated these properties to be resource production, which again is consistent with the ag preserve zoning and the idea of preserving land for agriculture. Um, the property is located in a moderate to high fire hazard area portion of the county managing the land for optimum grazing pastures will decrease fire fuels in addition to reducing the overall fire hazard. Putting land in the agriculture preserve will decrease um, development potential, therefore minimizing the exposure of people and structures to the risk of wildfires. Parcels located and designated um, in the critical habitat area for the California um, red-legged frog. Maintaining this land in open space and limiting residential development will help preserve the wildlife habitat. Young's Creek and a tributary to Cosgrove Creek are currently the seasonal water sources on the property. Um, primarily, this land is located in a high groundwater potential area, and there are four wells currently serving the residential and the um, agricultural needs of the property. This um, application was heard before your Agricultural Advisory Committee, and on a vote of 5-0, they recommended that you establish this contract. July 25th, your local planning commission actually heard this project as well, and their recommendation to you is also to establish, and that was a vote of 5-0. So in conclusion, the land and production both meet the minimum standards for the agriculture preserve pursuant to the Williamson Act. The application is consistent with the current general plan, and there are no conflicts with the general plan update. Maintaining the land in agriculture will reduce the fire hazard. Open space is beneficial to maintaining wildlife habitat. 
there is adequate water supply to sustain both the agricultural and the residential um, development on the property. And the application is supported by your agriculture, agricultural commissioner, your agricultural advisory committee, and your planning commission. Uh, pursuant to CEQA guidelines, this project is exempt from CEQA and a notice of exemption has been prepared. So our recommendation to you is to disestablish Ag Preserve Contract Number 309 while simultaneously establishing Ag Preserve Contract 364 and rezoning two parcels from the current RR and RA zoning to Agriculture Preserve pursuant to Res Board of Supervisors Resolution 75-489, which was adopted establishing uniform rules for administration of the Agriculture Preserves in Calaveras County. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Supervisor Mills. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> you stated something that's kind of interesting about this is a potential high groundwater area? Yes. How did we establish that? Um, we have, I'm not exactly sure where the data of the map comes from, but we have that, um, that GIS information available to us um, okay. as part of our daily it's one of the largest aquifers, yeah. uh, flowing aquifers in the county right there. Yeah. The, the, the question is, is, is this within the GSA basin, the, the Sigma basin, or is it not? This is outside the, uh, the, the basin. Just outside. Uh, and this is based on, we have uh, a, a layer in GIS that was established through uh, essentially well records. So okay. as wells are drilled and submitted to the uh, Environmental Management Agency, um, they have kept records over the years and determined that this area based on well reports they've received um, over the past as higher potential. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hit a gusher every time you drill, but it's no. higher potential there than in other places at the, in the county. Okay, that's just good to know, and, and I just wanted to understand where it was in relation to the basin. Yeah, it's outside the basin. Thank you. Good. The creek runs right through there, and a number there's a number of ponds and so forth there, so it's... It, it's, it's the same aquifer that runs all the way down that Valley Springs Public Utility draws, draws off of. Uh, along the road. And it's, yeah. Great, thank you. Public comment on this item. We are taking 19 and 20 together. Seeing no public comment, um, I, will bring it, I will bring it back to the board and close the hearing or vote first. Do you have any other questions? Supervisor Tafanelli? No, I would move both these items, sir. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we will close that public hearing and move on to the next public hearing. <laughs> so the second, um, excuse me. Sorry, Diane, I jumped the gun. I'm a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so items 21 and 22 uh, from the Planning Department to adopt a resolution establishing Agricultural Preserve Number 365 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Jason and Jody Brixey on behalf of the J. Hart Revocable Trust and to conduct a public hearing and adopt an ordinance approving the zoning amendment to Agricultural Preserve to recognize Agricultural Preserve Contract Number 365 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Jason and Jody Brixey on behalf of the J. Hart Revocable Trust and authorize the summary publication. And 22 as well. Oh, I'm very sorry. I was trying to figure out this map. Mr. Maurer. Okay, here we go. Uh, so the next contract is California Land Conservation Contract Application for Agriculture Preserve 365, consisting of five contiguous parcels, totaling 102.67 acres of land, located off Whittle Road and State Highway 49 near Angels Camp. Um, the operation consists of an organic grass-fed beef um, operation, 10 acres of irrigated pasture and the remaining of land is dry pasture for cattle grazing. Um, the Brixies um, report a gross annual income of $90,000, um, far exceeding the minimum requirement of $2,000. 
Um, the general plan designates this property um, as natural resource land, mineral resource area 2A. In addition, there's a portion of the property that is designated through the angel's um, sphere of influence as agricultural estates. Um, subsequent to the establishment of the agriculture um, preserve contract, um, as before, we will need to rezone um, the properties accordingly. Three out of the five parcels are currently zoned unclassified because they are not currently under contract. Um, there is a portion of this land that is currently in a non-renewal status. Um, the previous owner actually filed a notice of non-renewal that was prior to the purchase of the land by the Brixies. Um, and uh, that land has been under contract since 1996. Groundwater potential in this particular area is zero to low. Um, however, there are three wells that are currently serving the residential and the agricultural operational needs of the property. A portion of this property is under the jurisdiction or service area of the UPUD service area for water. Um, they did not note it. They did not note on the application whether or not they actually had service, so I'm assuming not. Um, there are two waterways provi providing seasonal water source for the um, for the cattle operation currently on the property. The land, as most of the county, is in a fi high fire hazard and of course maintaining the land will reduce the vegetation and thusly reducing the fire hazard. Uh, your county appointed agricultural commissioner did take this application uh, forward to your agriculture advisory committee and they did vote 5-0 to recommend that you establish the contract. Um, on July 4th, the Planning Commission did take a vote of 3 to 2. There were two apt commissioners absent that day, and their recommendation is also for you to establish this contract. Establishing an ag uh, preserve contract is exempt from CEQA, and as before, a notice of exemption has been prepared and uh, will be filed accordingly upon approval. In conclusion, um, the application is consistent with general plan policy pertaining to the preservation of agricultural land and open space. The land is capable of sustaining a viable agricultural operation as been proved in the past uh, and currently. Livestock grazing will control fire fuels and, fire ha and reduce the fire hazard. Your agricultural committee, um, agricultural advisory committee, agricultural commissioner, and your planning commission um, all are in support of this application recommending establishment of the contract. Very well. Questions from the board? Uh, Jen, is this the one that didn't have enough land in the original discussion? Yeah, so originally uh, a couple years ago they brought uh, forward an application that was less than 100 acres and the Ag Advisory Committee uh, took it under consideration and because of the, um, the lack of property, uh, meaning cattle operations and by ordinance in this or resolution in this county as well as government code indicates that you must have at least 100 acres of of land to qualify. There are some unique um, circumstances that we can make findings upon, but the commission uh, or the committee at that point did not want to do that. So they said, uh, you know, go forth with your agricultural operation, report back to us, and we'll maybe uh, take that under consideration sometime in the future. During that time period, they did obtain some additional property, which did put them over the 100 acre minimum. Thank you. I, I, the lady that they purchased the property from, I had some familiarity, yeah. so the coordination. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? Supervisor Calvin? Did you say some of the land's irrigated, correct? Yes. Does that make it prime under the void? Uh, I don't believe we have any consider uh, <coughs> prime ag land in this county. I, I think you'll find that down in the valley, but it's my right. understanding that we don't have any prime. No, that was my understanding too. But mm -hmm. I th thought if it was irrigated, it could no, be it was just a description of of the <clears throat> operation. That was just something that I had added because they had included it in their application. Okay, are we still not receiving any revenue from Williamson Act? Correct. Subvention funds are right. not 
being okay. handed down from the I'm state. I'm proud of the county for continuing the program. Yes. <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me. You mentioned that one of the parcels had been have non renewed gone in, so it's starting it all over again two, because it's yeah, going. Two, two of the five parcels were previously, or I should say currently, in the Ag Preserve. Um, the, pre, the prior owner did file a notice of non renewal, um, but this application will basically um, continue those parcels in the preserve in addition to adding three other parcels okay. to that existing. Okay. Thank, land. You. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you. Is there any further questions from the board? Public comment. Anybody want to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for a uh, further questions, discussion, or a motion. I would like to move items 21 and 22 on the Ag Preserve. Moved by Supervisor Mills. I will second. Second by Supervisor Toffinelli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. I will close that here and we will move on to the next item. Items 23 and 24 are from the planning department to adopt a resolution disestablishing agricultural preserve contract number 34 and simultaneously establishing agricultural preserve number 373 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Maurice and Amy Protzen on behalf of Bar Down Enterprises and to conduct a public hearing and adopt an ordinance approving the zoning amendment to Agricultural Preserve to recognize Agricultural Preserve contract number 373 pursuant to the Williamson Act for Maurice and Amy Protzen on behalf of Bar Down Enterprises and authorize a summary publication. I will open this public hearing. Okay, last one. Uh, California Land Conservation Contract and Zoning Amendment for Maurice and Amy Protzen, um, as said, on behalf of Bar Down Enterprises, um, to establish an agriculture preserve for a total of 467.35 acres of land off of Evans Road, located approximately one and a quarter miles northeast of the Burson Road and Highway 12 intersection near Valley Springs. Uh, in 1969, Ag Preserve contract number 34 was established for a total of 464.85 acres. In January of this year, um, the Protzens purchased six parcels of land encompassed by Ag, Ag Preserve contract number 34, in addition to two and a half acres of contig a contiguous parcel, which was previously the um, Southern Pacific Railroad right of way. That parcel was never included in the preserve, but it is smack down in the middle. Uh, so in order to um, create consistency and contiguous, um, now that those are all under the same ownership, we would like to include that parcel as well. Um, the Protzens are going to continue their lease agreement with Walter Valeni, who has been uh, running cattle on this land for many years. Uh, the current operation consists of 75 head of beef cattle, Previous years, they've reported a gross annual income of $50,000. Six of the parcels um, are, as I said before, are currently zoned AP, Ag Preserve, signifying the Williamson Act, in addition to the um, one parcel, which was the uh, previous or old railroad right-of-way, which is still zoned unclassified and uh, will need to be rezoned AP to signify the, uh, the preserve. The land is located in natural resource lands uh, um, identified in the general plan uh, with a high capability of sustaining agricultural operations. Um, under the general plan update, we have designated this property as resource production. And again, um, Ag Preserve is a compatible um, zoning and land use in that designation. Um, the property is located in a high fire hazard, hazard of the county area of the county maintaining this land um, for optimum grazing pastures will decrease fire fuels and thusly reducing the fire hazard. Putting the land in the Ag Preserve will also decrease development potential, minimizing the exposure of people and structures to the risk of wildfire. 
California National Natural Diversity Database identifies several special status species within five miles of this property, maintaining that open space will limit residential development um, and will help preserve the wildlife habitat. There are two tributaries um, to the McCallamy River providing seasonal water source on the property. Um, this land is located in an area of both low and high groundwater potential and as the other applications, there are currently four wells on the property serving the, the agricultural need. Your, agri uh, your Agriculture Advisory Committee um, did consider this application and they voted 5-0 for you to establish this contract. August 8th, um, the Planning Commission did consider this application as well and on a vote of 4-1, one, one being absent, um, their recommendation to you is as well to establish. So in conclusion, the land and the production both meet the minimum standards for the agriculture preserve. The application is consistent with the general plan and there are no conflicts with the general plan update. Maintaining the land in agriculture will reduce the wildlife or wildland um, fire hazard and open space is beneficial for maintaining wildlife habitat. There's an adequate water supply to sustain the agricultural operation and the application again is supported both by your agricultural advisory committee, your agricultural commissioner and your planning commission. Pursuant to CEQA guidelines, this project is exempt from CEQA and a notice of exemption has been prepared. So our recommendation to you is to disestablish Ag Preserve Contract number 34 while simultaneously establishing Ag Preserve Contract 373 for a total of 467.35 acres of land and to rezone one parcel from current unclassified zone to agriculture purpose agriculture preserve signifying the land is under contract. Thank you very much. Sir. Questions from the board? Seeing none, are there questions or comments from the public? This one I'm happy about. I'm a neighbor of the Cook Ranch. I met Mr. Land, I knew Mr. Cook, and I've spoken to the persons on the phone. My luck holds. I have good neighbors. And uh, I also have that wonderful view of that pasture out there next to my place. And I have improved fire protection, which I care about. So I'm really happy about this. And I'm happy about the other ones, too. Any Ag Preserve contracts we can get, I'm there. Thank you so much. Carter? Um, I'd like to bring to your attention that that property goes all the way from Highway 12 over to, I'm not sure whether it's Chili Camp or Com South Comanche Parkway. And um, I think it's more than just an uh, agriculture preserve. I think that it's um, a plan. And uh, it concerns me that all these different zoning changes um, could possibly be in anticipation of pot growing. And uh, it concerns me that um, people in our county or, this, you know, people, migrant people, might um, be used to have less than a proper lifestyle in the production of pot. And so I'm, I'm not just speaking to this particular one, but I'm speaking to the other ones that have been already approved. Thank you. Thank you. Is there other further public comment? Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. For further discussion, motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move both items 23 and 24. A motion by Supervisor Toffinelli. Second. Second by Supervisor Stopper. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5 0. Thank you. We'll close that hearing.
Peter's not out of here. Gina's running for the door. Uh, not we don't have a PowerPoint. If we need to bring up the actual text of the um, the document, I have it available if we need it. But uh, okay. item twenty five is from the planning department to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution approving the addendum to the negative declaration and adopting the two thousand nineteen housing element update. Good morning, Peter Maurer, Planning Director. With me today is uh, Jennifer Gestelum from uh, PlaceWorks, uh, our consultant for the housing element. Um, this is the sixth round of housing element updates, uh, the one element of the general plan that requires uh, timely update and state approval. Um, so we have been uh, in compliance uh, with the general plan or with the housing element uh, requirements. <laughs> Uh, when we last updated the element in 2015, um, these are typically updated in five-year increments. Uh, we are moving to an eight-year time frame, thankfully. Um, the housing element procedure is cumbersome, um, and it seems like you just finished doing it, and we're starting all over again. So at least with an eight-year program, it gives us a little bit more of a breathing room. Um, the major changes that we're looking at with this update is simply the uh, data information that uh, we, we need to go through when we look at um, all of the housing needs, the, the um, uh, what's what I'm looking for, um, just all, all, the, all the details of, of housing, employment, uh, the types of housing necessary to serve the residents of this community, people that currently are here as well as people that want to, to move here or um, young people uh, growing up and striking out on their own to find, try to find housing in the community in which they live. Um, on the whole, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we have um, come close to meeting our regional housing needs assessment um, almost every, every cycle. Um, and uh, which is a far cry from the struggles that other jurisdictions, particularly in the populated uh, Bay Area and Southern California regions, um, where housing costs are astronomical, um, but they also match the, um, uh, the income that people get in some, you know, some businesses, some industries working in the Bay Area particularly. Uh, so it's always a struggle to find uh, housing for the full range of um, needs in a community uh, and the, um, the housing assessment, the, the numbers provided by the state to um, the count, well to the COG, which then um, identifies how that's distributed within uh, the uh, regional, um, regional area. We're very fortunate that um, our region is just the county in the city of Angels Camp. Uh, in larger jurisdictions, um, you know, ABAG, uh, Sacramento Area Council of Governments, um, they've got 20 or 30 or more jurisdictions that are fighting <coughs> over who, who, who's responsible for pr providing the housing. Um, and I've had many, many conversations with directors of other counties about what a struggle it is to, um, to um, negotiate what is a regional uh, share of the housing. Um, we work closely with the city. Uh, we're on the same time frame as the city for updating our general plan, and so we're on, on track to, to do that. Um, I think the biggest issue that we're looking at is um, special needs housing. You know, we had a lot of discussion earlier today about um, uh, homelessness. You know, we do not have any uh, housing f uh, for homeless in this county, so people are being sent to um, Tuolumne or, or Amador County if they are in need. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at. Um, workforce housing is probably the biggest need. Uh, it's really not a problem for the, um, the housing industry to provide um, above moderate uh, housing. That's what sells. That's where they can make a profit. It's the uh, low to moderate housing that is um, a struggle. Um, and so 
you know, the policies um, are pretty much the same as they've been for the last several uh, cycles, uh, looking at ways to streamline the, um, the permitting process for housing, looking at ways to reduce costs. Uh, we keep getting more and more mandates from the state regarding fire, fire safety and other health and safety requirements for construction costs to keep driving it up. And so what we really looked at this round is what can we do to try to lower those costs or at least minimize the uh, in increased costs as well as um, how do we look at the full range of needs. Um, one of the things that we'll be looking at in the future is the effect of um, short-term rental housing uh, on the housing market uh, for workforce housing. Um, it's particularly uh, an issue in many, many jurisdictions where there is a tourist economy. Uh, the um, lodging needs of the community help pay a lot of bills. Uh, but also make it more more challenging for the people that work in the tourist industries to um, to find housing, um, as well as just the housing for um, people like uh, my planning staff or school teachers. Uh, those are the um, you know the, 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 the what we call workforce housing, the people that make a decent wage um, but can't find um, housing where they want want to live. Uh, again, it's not as as a, challenge as it is in say Bay Area uh, communities, but it's still a challenge that we have here. So um, with that, um, this has been reviewed by the Planning Commission. They had made a number of edits which have been forwarded on to you. There is one, um, uh, I, uh, one, one note that I wanted to make, um, uh, Supervisor Calloway pointed out to me the other day that on page 11, um, where it talks about income and employment, the table 4-4 does not reflect the numbers in the paragraph that explains that. The, the difference had a number. It's not quite sure how that happened, but um, I had uh, Jennifer look up the information yesterday, and the numbers in the 4.4, um, I'm sorry, 4.3, um, the numbers in the table are accurate, and we will be correcting the numbers in the um, uh, in the table above that, and this is under race and ethnicity. Uh, so um, just wanted to clarify that, that the table numbers are correct and not the numbers in the, um, the paragraph before that. Um, we have prepared, or PlaceWorks prepared for us, an addendum to the negative declaration uh, that was prepared for the 2010 housing element, since it's not a significant change in policy. There aren't any significant environmental effects. Um, we reviewed that environmental document. It's uh, included in your packet. We um, did an addendum which identifies you know, where there might be some changes. We found that none of them really um, rose to the level of needing to do a new environmental document. So we're recommending that you um, approve the addendum uh, to the negative declaration at the same time that you um, adopt this new housing element. Do you have any questions for me or Jennifer? Any questions for the board? Yeah. So where's the Outside of the list of ones I sent you earlier. <clears throat> How do we go from five to eight years? I wasn't clear. So the state law changed that oh, okay. um, allowed uh, counties and cities, as long as the entire region changes to that same. And so we work with the COG, with the city, uh, and uh, the county to change that. It requires a four-year um, regional transportation plan cycle, because it used to be on the same cycle as the reg regional transportation plan, which is a five-year plan. So now the COG has to do a four-year update to the regional transportation plan, so it corresponds um, to the eight-year cycle that we're now on with the housing element. So much of funding for particularly uh, transportation projects is tied to a, an updated and certified housing element. Uh, and every year, the legislature tries to link more and more funding sources to the housing element. Um, we routinely fight some of those linkages, but the legislature continues to try to connect them more and more. Mm -hmm. So having a certified element is very critical. 
Um, the timing is that we need to, we've already reviewed it once with the uh, um, Housing Community Development Department. Uh, they have said that it meets the requirements. The Planning Commission made a few edits. The uh, ACD did review that, those and said, yeah, these are okay. Uh, and so once the final adoption is made, we'll, we'll uh, resubmit it to the state. The deadline for that is October 15th. Okay. I have a couple. I'm not sure if they're questions or editorial comments, but I don't remember seeing if we have um, ag housing or work like I know there's some in the valley, migrant housing for, <clears throat> and I can't remember if I saw that in there or not, um, so that, you know, I want to pick my grapes or trim my almond trees or olive trees. Can we allow, instead of building housing, allow temporary housing to come in, like some of the mobile tiny homes or uh, motor homes or so forth. I don't remember <clears throat> seeing that as an option. Um, and <clears throat> on, I remember reading it, Mr. Maurer, but I, now I can't find it, of course. You were going to do, or your department, a study in a couple of years or so on the Airbnb. I use that sort of generically. Is that still in the plan? Yes, yeah, so there are oh, two um, so uh, implementation programs. One, uh, zoning for farm worker housing. Right. Uh, so uh, measure H-3B. Um, and uh, I know that there is a um, directive to, um, and I can't, can't find it at the moment, but I know that there is um, a measure in there to do a study to see what the effect of um, short-term vacation rental has on the workforce housing. Okay, so that's something that um, the department's proposing, not anything that's mandated? It's not mandated. It's something that uh, we think is, is okay. um, advisable. It actually was in the prior element. Uh, we just didn't have a chance to get that one done, so we, we carried that over from, from okay. the previous. Uh, and version. then probably the one that's most controversial, if we get a project for a subdivision, will we require the developer to allocate X number to workforce housing, as an example? We do not have a measure that has inclusionary zoning. Excuse as, me, thank as you. A, yeah, as a, a mandate. Um, a lot of communities are doing that. Say if you're gonna be building um, you know, housing, a certain number has to meet different um, wage uh, or, or uh, income levels. We do not have that here in this element. Okay, thank you. Any questions here? Seeing none, I'll ask for public comment. Same rules, uh, three minutes. Please uh, come on up. Joyce Tech with MyValleySprings.com. A long time ago, with a developer, Mark Pringle, down in Valley Springs area, we had the opportunity to negotiate with him to get some f affordable housing included in his subdivision. It's, it should be a privilege to build here, and our community needs affordable housing, so it makes sense to me that we create some provision so that that can happen. That's all. Thank you. I second that. Um, I think it's really important that people have a place to live and um, that it's affordable. I would really love to see when you adopt this that you adopt that mandate that if you're going to develop here, you have to develop for all income brackets. I'd hate to see this place just be um, a playground for the very wealthy and then hear all these complaints about people in the streets. Thank you.
There is no such thing as affordable housing in California. For one thing, the state of California is allowing our state to burn up. And in the process, houses that people live in and no longer can live there. In Chico, they are just, um, it's unbelievable. It's even affecting all the way over to Citrus Heights as far as the huge amount of money that it costs to rent or buy. And it makes it very hard for people that have limited incomes are not able to work. And um, I think that the government should get out of it and pay attention to putting out the fires quickly. And um, another thing about it is is that those fires, when they burn those, those um, houses up, it causes other people who own property, who own houses, who own rentals, to be able to hike their prices up for their rents twice as much. And um, I'm not saying that I believe that um, it should be mandatory in the plans to have so-called affordable housing because I don't believe it's possible. Because what people expect from people to have a kosher house with all the rules and regulations, it isn't really needed in California. California is a warm uh, state. We don't need all the rules and regulations that, re that are required, and people could come up with their own housing needs if it weren't for all these rules and regulations. Thank you. Tom? I'd like to propose <clears throat> that the board consider an edit consisting of adding one word and a comma um, and I'm looking at page 135 of the housing element, which is page 608 of the agenda packet. <clears throat> and I'm looking at item H1J, which presently reads, the county shall develop a program to provide fee reductions, fee waivers, deferral payments, or installment payments for development and or building fees on replacement projects for owners who lost structures in state or federal declared disasters. <clears throat> and the edit that I would propose for you to consider is adding the word county, <clears throat> which would enable the county in the event that the state or the feds didn't declare it a disaster within the county, <clears throat> that you, the Board of Supervisors, could declare a disaster um, and enable you to enact that program um, at your discretion rather than only in cases where the state or the feds declared a disaster. Um, gives you a little more flexibility and discretion. Tom, what, what package page? Uh, 608 in the um, agenda packet, which is 135 of the housing element. Oh, okay. Thank you. And it's H1J. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a public comment, Al? Yeah. Uh, Al Scallon, Taxpayer Association. Uh, we've got some history um, on what the consequences are when government attempts to control the marketplace. We have the Soviet Union, which had five-year plans, and the consequences were pretty awful for the people. California is moving that direction. It's almost suggesting government is responsible for housing. In a free society, how can government be responsible for housing? It's, 
It's an oxymoron. It, it can't happen because you know, people are responsible for their own housing, for creating it, for buying it, for renting it. And so for every, uh, what well, we're thankful that we don't have this inclusionary zoning. Um, that is a very bad idea, <clears throat> which further depresses the housing market because we have a situation of robbing Peter, Peter to pay Paul, and it's not a healthy environment to, to put that kind of um, uh, approach into the free market. It doesn't work. The best experts uh, in development and planning uh, admit that that doesn't work. So we're blessed that we have the wisdom not to include it. Uh, this, we're at a point now where you have a final package, and uh, the only thing I could, I could think of is, uh, is to, as time goes by and there's further amendments to the housing element, that you focus on, on making our regulations freedom friendly and respect of property rights. By respecting property, respecting property rights, you allow people to provide, when there's a need for something, uh, um, provide a way of so solving those needs. One such um, uh, need would be inex for inexpensive housing would be um, the, the, the allow, allow people to, uh, to rent uh, low-cost housing such as RVs and, and uh, mobile homes, RV parks, that sort of thing. The, uh, by allowing the maximum flexibility, you'll be able to meet the demand by the people, allowing the people to meet their own demand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for further discussion. Or, or a motion or amendment? Mr. Rosicali? <clears throat> On the way to board this morning, I was listening to the radio, and <clears throat> they were talking about the migration out of California and to other states where there was large migration out. And the reason, the primary reason for the mar migration out of California was housing. I mean, we sort of up here, if you've been here a long time, we think of housing <laughs> unaffordable as the Bay Area or the last Los Angeles area. But up here, I'm hearing it also in Calaveras County. And I'm hearing it from uh, workforce people, which is, now, do I want to touch the Airbnb scenario? Not in your lifetime do I want to. But I think it's something that we, we're going to have to deal with whether we want to or not if we want to take housing seriously. I mean, I've listened to Mr. Segala for years um, talk this way, and, and occasionally I learn something from him. But we have a housing element because nothing's happened in the free market to cause us not to have a housing element. Um, I agree I don't like inclusionary, but I think that's something that we have to talk about. We can't be afraid of it. You know, we heard earlier, I don't want homeless shelters in my neighborhood. You can go to, I mean, people in San Andreas are saying, why does everything have to be in San Andreas? You know, why can't it be out through the rest of the county and in Valley Springs, in Arnold? I mean, it, I, year, half a year, two years ago, I was asked um, to help a, a family find emergency shelter. And I had to call Amador and Tuolumne because we have nothing in Calaveras County. That was pretty embarrassing. Um, I know I'm just sort of editorializing, but I th think we really need to address some of these very difficult issues regarding housing because it is an issue in Calaveras County. And I, to look at it, well, once every five years or once every eight years, it just keeps pushing it down the road. I strongly believe it's a subject that we need to discuss. I'm not sure the best way to manage it or to handle it, but 
to maybe we can hire place works to help us through the process. But um, there's things that Tom mentioned, the one he mentioned, I thought if your house burned, you could get a permit and you not have to pay. So am I missing something that he's talking about, Mr. Maurer? I'm not sure of the specifics of what uh, benefits we might have for someone who's lost their home. I need to check with the building department on that. Uh, I do believe that there are some um, programs that we have for individuals. Uh, what we're looking at is more on a, a, a area-wide basis. If there is a declared disaster that you know number you know number of people lost their homes, like in the Butte fire, what would we do? I don't have a problem with adding the uh, word county to that list of declared disasters. You know, it's it's going to end up being a policy call by uh, the board at that, at that time. Uh, and if we have a program that provides relief, um, and for whatever reason the state or the federal government doesn't um, declare it, and we think it's important enough to do that, we certainly can. So um, the whole point of that measure is to provide some relief for the folks that lost their homes um, without burdening, you know, the, the taxpayers and other, you know, so you have to strike that balance of, you know, the cost of providing the service of, of you know, reviewing new new permits for, uh, for um, rebuilt homes uh, and the individual loss of the people that, that uh, lost their homes. Yeah, I think the county, I'm sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think the county really missed the boat on that in 2015 and 16 because uh, we were trying to stay whole and I'm sure we lost it in the accumulated taxes and fees and work that would have happened had we decided just to waive all that and get the building going but we are where we are today <coughs> we have to move forward and i would support adding counties there is there any material impact that that word would have no. to this document no sure as your notes. yeah my only concern with that is that uh, when you talk state and federal declared disasters you're basically following stafford act and you're following those rules. If we insert something to say county, that kind of messes a little bit with that overall concept. So I would say if we're gonna put county in here, it needs to be somewhere in kind of a separate statement so we don't get into the Stafford Act discussions. I, I, I don't think that that would um, conflict with you know the, the requirements for you know, reimbursement for disasters when there's a federally declared disaster. There's all kinds of various programs that when a state or federal government um, declares a disaster. This is fairly narrowly focused just to providing, you know, fee waivers, reductions, deferral payments uh, on building permits. And, and I, I don't believe that we create a conflict uh, with all the other provisions that are in place when a state or federally declared disaster occurs and the benefits that we might get from having that declaration. Chair Overlink, I got other things to talk about, sure. but let's get this part dealt with first. Okay. Mr. Sure, Stopper? Uh, I'm, I'm good with, it as recommended, as without the added, adding, adding in counties or county. Okay. So we have a general poll on that. We could add that in for the motion at the end. Sure, as Stopper? Yeah, we'll just speak of, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm happy to add county into this. Um, what this says, though, is the county shall develop a program, Dennis. So that program will be coming to us if it, you know we can look at it, and whatever it says. But to add county, uh, I'm, I'm, I would support that. Okay. So we'll put that in the motion when we move forward. Supervisor Mills, you've got other questions? Yeah. Um, Thank you for including or being sure that the, uh, it's included on page uh, 101 about the density bonus because I've had conversations with uh, potential developers down in the Copperopolis <coughs> area about how that would work for them, especially when we talk about clustered housing or we talk about, uh, you know, trying to find ways to provide low-income housing in their area without uh, them uh, being substantially hit financially because now they've moved all of their potential development into one spot on their parcel and now they can't develop anything else outside of that. There's, that we've got to work through that to be sure that they don't, in essence, take a hit for wanting to go in that direction. And I know there's one developer who wants to go in that direction. So uh, SB 435, I think, is a good discussion. 
Um, I, I know of several people who have moved out of the state. Okay, I moved, I've seen a lot of people move out of the state. But one of the things that they are continually talking about is the cost per foot to build homes in California. And uh, I know that, for instance, in areas of Tennessee and Alabama, and those, uh, believe me, I don't consider that negative because there's a lot of industry out in those areas of uh, around Fayetteville and Huntsville, uh, 32 to $35 a square foot. You can't even get started in California for 32 to 35 a square foot. And when they're talking about their water and sewer rates and their power rates and all of that, a $400 water sewer power in California is now $135 in those states. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, for fixed income and low income people, migrating to another area that, uh, that has these lower costs of living, it seems to be an undeclared option that they're, they're going to have to go in that direction because our, our environmental regulations and our zoning regulations and everything else are just literally driving the cost per foot to the point where low income people cannot be able to be here at a, at a reasonable rate. So yes, we can provide low income assistance through LIHEAP and all of the LEAP and all the other programs that are available, but is that sufficient to meet the needs that we're talking about on a statewide basis? I don't think so. So although this is it's great for us to put this down and declare that we're gonna have a policy of, of trying to develop affordable housing, the state needs to kind of look back and I'm going to give one specific example. We take wood, timber, out of our forests in California. We put them on ships, and we chug them with, with number four diesel or worse to Chile to have them manufactured into plywood to send it back, chug it back to California so we can put it on houses. That's just an example of how far afield we've gone from the reality that is not present in other states. So I'm just I'm pontificating here for a moment, but I think it is the challenge that the state feels is, is if we're going to fix our housing crisis, then we need to fix the cost of housing that is associated in creating that crisis. Yeah. Are there other comments from the board? Stop it. <clears throat> just looking at the cost. Uh, if you're on well and septic, and the typical fees, you're paying $46,000 to install that. If you're on water and sewer, initial cost with the fees, $30,000. So anywhere from $30,000 to $45,000 at 35 bucks a square foot, that would give you a thousand square foot in another state. I'll move this item. With including the and, change. Um, with, as modified. We have a motion by Supervisor Cowan. A motion. I'll Cowley second. As modified. Second by Supervisor Toffinelli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item 26 is from the Administrative Office to provide direction to staff on how to proceed in filling the vacancy for the Auditor Controller. Well, Mr. Chair, can we take just two minutes to allow them to? Yeah, good call. Yes. Yeah, good. Two minutes to clear out. <laughs> you got two minutes. All right, we are on, welcome back. We are on item 26. Oh, you read it. Good morning. This item is before the board for staff to receive direction on how to fill the county audit, the vacancy in the county auditor's position. As you are aware, that position became a vacant on September 2nd of this year. Government code requires that the board fill that vacancy. You do have some options on how you fill that vacancy. The board has the option to appoint into the position 
or identify a, an application process where candidates can be selected from a pool. If you choose to uh, select from a pool, you can either direct the CAO or Human Resources to develop the pool and do initial screening, or the board could choose to interview applicants from the pool. Um, it is important to note that if the board were to choose to interview applicants, as you did previously with the sheriff uh, in past years, you would have to conduct those interviews in public. Um, the, it is required, regardless of how you choose to select, that the candidates do have to meet all the requirements of the position, including uh, residency requirements. And so with that, I'll leave it to board discussion on direction to how to fill, fill the vacancy. Okay. The uh, agenda item gave us three, four questions to sort of tr help us uh, lead towards this. Um, are there any statements before we start going into these? First question is, uh, does the board simply want, want to simply attempt consensus on an appointee, or does the board want to solicit application? Solicit applications. Okay. Two Res Mills? Solicit applications. Two Res Topper? Solicit applications. Two Res Top and I? The point. Okay, I go with solicit applications. So, second question is, does the board want to screen applications publicly or through an interview panel? Interview panel. This is scary. Interview panel. Here we go. <laughs> Match made in heaven. <clears throat> interview Stop. panel. Serious so tough enough? Panel. Okay, we'll do it through a panel. Um, how many candidates do we want to bring forward to the board? I, I don't feel like I can answer that. Um, you know, I guess I'd leave it up to the panel. I mean, this is really an important position. I'm all every time there's been an opening that I'm cognizant of for an elected position, we've always um, had candidates and mm. no that's them. you're incorrect we did uh, Barbara uh, Uke was the only one oh, we did right. with Jeff Tuttle passed that's away right. that's Jeff, correct but we but and we Jeff appointed was, her right but Jeff was part of an interview um, that we did publicly for district attorney and yes. the sheriff so I mean it's has nothing to do with what's recommended mm -hmm. to us. I just think we should have a panel, but I'm not, I don't feel like to put a number on it because one, the qualifications are quite mm -hmm. rigid and I just, um, so it could be three, it could be five. I mean, I don't want to do 10, but um, I don't think we're going to find 10. Two resumes? Top three. No more than three? No more than three. Supervisor Stopper? I will, would agree with Ms. Calloway. Um, the pool will be limited in the qualifications. With that, I think uh, we can leave it open-ended and give each person opportunity to put in an application that would qualify underneath the qualifications. No limit on interviews. Supervisor Toffinelli? Well, it, I'm, it doesn't, that doesn't, then why have an interview panel? If you're going to just not have a limit on what you're going to bring forward, the panel is supposed to whittle it down to the number of qualified applications that they feel are the best people for it. I mean, that would be the reason for that. Otherwise, we could just do it in public, which was one of the questions. Um, so I'm not sure where that's going. Would you want to go to uh, top two? I would, you know, I don't know how many qualified people you're going to get. I don't know if you're going to go out and solicit. Is it going to go out to different channels nationwide? W what are we going to do to get these people to the interview panel um, and go from there? I, you know, if, it depends on the number of people you're going to get. I, I would say three is, if you get that many, you may only get two total for the interview panel to interview. I don't know. So 
Um, but to just say no limit, uh, why do we have the panel? I don't think we're saying no limit, Supervisor. I think, you know, just to put a figure, because I think the pool, as you showed, will probably be quite small. Um, and if, let's say, there's two and one and the panel says one of the two doesn't even meet the quali doesn't meet the qualifications and there's one. But if there's ten, I don't think we want to interview. I don't think I want to interview ten people. I, usually we have three to five that come to the board. I, I, this is a significant, I, it's an elected position. After, after, after rereading the question, I would tend to agree with Supervisor Toffinelli and limit it to the candidates that they put forward to the board from the panel uh, to, to a number three, I would be fine with. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in the same spot. I think let the panel screen, don't bring us more than three. Okay, the next question was, excuse me while my computer logged off. Um, we want to interview all the, we want to be part of this interview process. Is that the consensus? Yes. 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 Okay. Are there other questions before I go to public comment that we're not giving clear direction on? Just clarity for me, um, when I hear you say panel, you're um, directing me to develop a panel. Um, screen the applicants through paper and then interview and put forward no more than three finalists but potentially up to three there may be one two or there might be one I'm, <coughs> I didn't know that we were saying an interview panel is just doing a paper interview no, no, no. so so the initial paper screening and then an interview mm -hmm. process and then put through forward. the panel got it okay thank you Where's <clears throat> um, One question that's not here is the timeline. I, I think maybe discussing that. I mean, what, re reading the state laws to appointments, it's within a reasonable amount of time, but that, that leaves a lot to inter interpretation. So, um, do we want to discuss the timeline on this, or do we want to kind of leave it out for a few months and? Let the process go through and see if anybody potentially can put in applications. I would suggest, um, I certainly would like to consult with Judy on this, but typically at least uh, three to four weeks as a recruitment process, and then we close it and do a paper screening <coughs> and, and view then um, what we do with other positions. If at that point we haven't, we don't have a qualified pool, then we could always extend it. Um, but this announcement has been out for months so uh, our public has been aware uh, maybe not all of the candidates but we've already had a you know about a four week lead time for for public that may be interested that's that's within the county correct so correct. if you're looking to go outside of the county yes. I, I'm just you saying if you don't have county. qualified because that's the way the board chose to go instead of appointing that that are are you just going to say any qualified people within the county uh, I, mean, I see marita shaking her head but i don't see anybody else shaking their head as they far have as to qualification is they have to live in the county i ain't go to kansas city uh, i i don't disagree with that doesn't mean they can't move here and live in the county yeah i just want to clarify they have to meet the requirements of the position prior to appointment so as long as they are a, a resident of the county and meet all of the requirements of the um, elected office by the time the board takes action to appoint the person, that is fine. Thank so, you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. I think the speed in which we do this is, is incumbent because of the, uh, the critical nature of what the staff is needing to do. Uh, between now and because you've got a CAFRS to do you you've got some other stuff that's got to be done and so whoever's going to take this it's going to be thrown to the wolves very quickly so I don't think that we should delay I'm sure our uh, interim or acting auditor can I'm not questioning the ability of the staff here I'm so just simply saying this is I think it needs to be expedited I think that I think there's clear as quick as you can but do it correctly yeah Public comment. It's okay. 
Al? Uh, Al Sagan with Taxpayer Association. Um, one thing we might, might want to look at to see if the requirements exactly meet the state state requirements or are they um, in excess of that. <clears throat> if the requirements are too tight, we won't get many applicants. It makes sense. Um, uh, the next thing I do is review this, the salary of the position uh, and compare it to other other counties. And so <clears throat> we won't have a repeat of a previous problem we had with the uh, uh, our last uh, auditor, where she really disapproved of the uh, salary that she uh, uh, she was getting. Uh, and the last thing I think we're concerned about is this should be an elected position rather than appointed. The reason for that is that if it's appointed, it's hard to have that arm's length um, relationship with the auditor controller if her position is dependent upon the approval of the board of supervisors. So it's, it's a hard job, but uh, I, I think that we, if we, if our, if the requirements are reasonable, the salary is competitive, and uh, uh, and we really reach out nationwide. Um, of course, they would have to live here. I think if this if this is a constitutional office, you know, if they're if they um, if they win the election, so. Um, we would be screening candidates that would be suitable to run for office, and then the public would decide who our next auditor would be. In our our opinion, that's we, that the best way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I agree with most of what Al said, and I'm curious if that if there is a path to getting this person on a ballot soon, because. There's no path I'm seeing you shake your head no. Um, it just seems to me that because there's close to over three years left in this, that this ought to go to the voters at some point. And um, so I guess if it can't legally, that's too bad. I really wish we could have met the salary needs of the previous auditor. I think she did a bang up job and I'm sad that she left. I'm very comfortable with her deputy taking it on until we can have a new election. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? I'll bring it back to the board. Um, I think we'd all like to have this on the next ballot, but we don't have that privilege. <clears throat> it's pretty cut and dry there. So um, this was a to provide direction. Staff, do you feel like, Al, you feel like you got what you need from us? Hey, Al was clear uh, up until public comment, no changes after public comment. The direction is still the same. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. With that, we will take up the budget after lunch. It should be an exciting afternoon for those of you who want to stick around. We are on break until 1.30. Thank you.